Good morning, everyone. Wow, I'm so excited. Everybody can hear me all right? Yeah. Um, I feel very excited to see so many faces, especially all these beautiful uh, children over in uh, uh, in Vietnam. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, welcome one and all. Um, I suggest we start with the short meditation uh, before we uh, get into the, the talking part. Um, so this meeting is being recorded and we'll um, probably upload it later. I hope that's fine with you. Um, so find a comfortable position with your back straight, uh, take a deep breath, uh, relax, and then um, I'll guide you through a short meditation um, to get you into the into the mood for our, our sharing. Uh, and then meanwhile, people will still be joining, probably. So I'll start with the uh, sound of the bell. So take a deep few breaths to arrive here in this moment. Take a moment to drop everything that you were doing before and all the thoughts of what will happen after. You're just here sitting on your chair or cushion And as you breathe in, feel the air coming in through your nose, through your mouth, into your lungs. Can you feel the fresh air coming in, given to us by the trees? Can you feel the trees in your breath? As your breath goes in, feeling, feel it going deep into your lungs. It goes into your blood. And it provides oxygen to all the cells of your body to give you energy for all the things you enjoy to do today. All these things are in our breath. Our breath connects us to the nature around us and to life inside us. And then the oxygen goes into our cells together with the sugars it's the fuel for all our bodily processes. We can take a moment to check in with our body. Do we feel energized? We're sleepy, hungry full can we feel our digestion the oxygen we breathe mixes with the sugars from our food so as we breathe we can also become aware of the food that's inside of us which is giving us the energy to sit here to be here
and this food that we ate today or last night came from plants or from animals who ate plants vegetables and rice and potatoes mixing with the oxygen in our breath can we feel all these beautiful plants while we are breathing nourishing our body and can we feel the connection with the farmer who took care of this plant so we could eat the food we had can send gratitude to the farmer. The food we had is only possible through the soil, which holds all the nutrients for the food and the rain. And ultimately the sunshine, all the food, all the energy we have comes from the sun. We are solar powered beings. Can we feel the sun in our breath, the sun in our food? Can we feel how all these things are connected? How we enter our And all this through the simple act of breathing and just sitting here. Let's take a moment to sit with this awareness before we move into the more active part of the session. What is to spring up in us? Gratitude, no oh, awe, happiness. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, sunshines and rain and plants and lovely people. Um, I have a problem with my Zoom, so I cannot see all of your faces, but I'll just assume all of you are smiling and feeling very comfortable. Um, before I give the word to our wonderful guests of today, um, I'll read, and uh, before I introduce them, um, I'll... Uh, read a short quote of our teacher um, to set the stage for the day. This is um, from the book, How to Eat.
Our way of eating and producing food can be very violent to other species, to our own bodies, and to the earth. Or our way of growing, distributing, and eating food can be part of creating a larger healing. We get to choose. The planet suffers deeply because of the way many of us eat now. Forests are raised to grow grain to feed livestock. And the way the animals are raised pollutes our water and air. A lot of grain and water is also used to make alcohol. Tens of thousands of children die of starvation and malnutrition every day, even though our earth has the ability to feed us all. With each meal, we make choices that help or harm the planet. What shall I eat today is a very deep question. You might want to ask yourself that question every morning. You may find that as you practice mindful eating and begin to look deeply at what you eat and drink, your desire for certain foods may change. Your happiness and that of the earth are intertwined. So, um, yeah, I hope that gives you an idea about what we're going to share about today, more or less. And then uh, I'd love to introduce you all uh, to our uh, panel members of the day. Uh, and I'll go through them one by one. And then maybe they can just say hi, because then Zoom automatically highlights them. And then people can see your face. Um, so I'll go, go through to them roughly from east to west. Uh, so when we go all the way uh, down under, we found we find Brother Tenzin in uh, who's in Australia. Can you say hi, Brother Tenzin? Hi, everybody. Lovely to be here to see all your smiling faces. Uh, so Brother Tenzin, he discovered natural farming in uh, because of uh, Fukuoka's one straw revolution while in high school, um, and he uh, already then uh, tried to. Uh, convert the family garden into a food forest, which uh, wasn't uh, perceived as uh, well by everyone. He had a career in ecology, specializing in the impacts of climate change and biodiversity. It led him to much time for quiet reflection in the rainforest of Northern Australia. A visit to Plum Village in France germinated the aspiration to help build sustainable spiritual community and the monastic path as a means to devote more time to practice of mindful living. He is ordained as a monk in the Mahayana tradition and currently lives in the Blue Mountains near Sydney, where he's helping to build Mountain Spring, a practice center in the Plum Village tradition, including a syntropic farm that he is starting. So welcome, Brother Tenzin. Thank you so uh, much, Chaz. And thank you for, for all of your organizing, uh, bringing all of this together. I'm really excited also to, to share and to, to learn from you all. So thank you so much. Okay, let's 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 hope everything works without any technical issues, and then you can thank me at the end. <laughs> uh, next is uh, in uh, Singapore is Brother Will. Are you there, Brother Will? Hello, dear everyone. So, uh, Brother Will experienced composting for the first time at the Plum Village Happy Farm during the 2014-21 day retreat. Pretty legendary retreat. I can I can vouch for that. Uh, he went home to Malaysia to uh, co-found uh, a farm called Folo, which means feed our loved ones. It's a community farm that collects and composts three tons of food waste every day to grow food for his community. Folo was founded on the principles of the four nutriments and inspired by Thai's teaching of no mud, no lotus. His learning journey continues and he's now an aspiring agroforester. Will practices with the Wake Up Singapore and Singapore's Joyful Garden Sangha and is ordained as in the order of interbeing with the Dharma name, crossing to the other shore of the heart. Welcome, Brother Will. Um, next, we move to uh, Vietnam, where we have a whole lot of friends sitting there. Uh, can you say hi? Hello. Sister Han. Hello. And <laughs> wow. 
I feel so excited to have uh, all these uh, beautiful uh, young people with us today. Uh, so Sister Han is the founder and manager of Nui Thuong, uh, forgive me for my pronunciation, an organic farming project in southern Vietnam that offers local children free education and vocational training. The garden is a model for kids and local farmers to discover ways to build a flourishing farm without harmful chemicals. In Wei Tong, they practice mindfulness meditation, gratitude, and sharing. Many of the children come from broken families and are in need of mental and emotional support. Besides that, Wei Tong offers them soft skills like leadership, communication, business, critical thinking, music, and art. Hang practices with the Plum Village Thailand and the Compassionate Ocean Sangha. Welcome, Sister Hang and friends. And then next we take an airplane or uh, maybe a boat and we go all the way to France, to Plum Village, where we will meet our Plum Village happy farmers. Um, first I'll introduce is Brother Mick. Are you there, Brother Mick? Good morning. Morning, Brother Mick. Lovely to see you today. Uh, Brother Mick has been the manager of the Plum Village Happy Farm in Upper Hamlet since 2016. Mick has a 20 year career in horticulture, ecology and agriculture beginning in Ireland and in the UK, which has taken him all over the world. Mick put his roots down in the soil of Plum Village tradition after Tay and Sangha visited Ireland in 2012. He's a co-founder of the Leaves of One Tree Sangha in Belfast and still an active supporting member of the Irish Sangha from France as the chairperson of the Plum Village Irish Charity Mindfulness Ireland. Welcome, Brother Mick. Thank you, Jazz. Thanks for organizing. And can I just give a shout out to, to Brother Daniel in Berlin, who I see on the screen, who is our, our farm ancestor, our patriarch of the happy farm. Oh, okay. Nice to see him, as well as Andrea and Julie. Over. And then a continuation, I see Owen in the Happy Farm office on another little cell. I'm Brother Tenzin, who, who worked the soil also in Upper Hamlet. Thanks for organizing, Jess. Yeah, welcome Mick and other Happy Farmers. Uh, Brother Daniel, who founded, co-founded a Happy Farm, I think, somewhere in 2012. Maybe he can share uh, later if we have time. Um, next, we go to our sisters who are, I think, in Lower Hamlet at the moment. Um, morning, uh, Andrea and Julie. Hello. Uh, are they here? Do you hear us? Can you hear us now? Yes, okay. we can hear and see you loud and clear. Oh, wonderful. Very nice to see you all. <laughs> so, um, let me go ahead and introduce you all. On the right hand side uh, of the screen, you saw Sister Andrea, who accidentally came to the Interzine Center in Germany while she was visiting different eco villages in Germany in 2012. That's how she uh, discovered Thai and the Plum Village tradition. She has lived as a lay sister in Plum Village from end of 2014 to 2018, which was a life-changing experience for her. Uh, she started volunteering uh, a little bit in the Upper Hamlet, Happy Farm, and then uh, this led her to help establish the Happy Farm in Lower Hamlet in 2016. Um, after leaving Plum Village, she founded a CSA, a community-supported agriculture project and I think she uh, ex can uh, explain more later what exactly that is for those who don't know it. Um, she, In this way she's part of a movement of people taking back the sovereignty for their food production. Uh, she, With a team of two people they are growing vegetables for 70 people who finance the whole process. Welcome Sister Andrea. And then uh, on the left hand side we have Sister Julie who uh, came to our practice in 2017. Uh, that year she did the winter retreat, which now is called the range retreat, where she fell in love with our tradition. 
she traveled to India, planted some trees there, uh, but then came back to Plum Village uh, middle of 2018, where she's been ever since and part of the Happy Farm team. She helped set up a Happy Farm in New Hamlet and then a year later moved to Lower Hamlet, uh, where she's now part of the Happy Farm team. Um, and she believes being a happy farmer in Plum Village is an amazing way uh, to practice. When she leaves uh, Plum Village, uh, she's planning to leave uh, in a few months. And then she wants to continue being a happy farmer in a different form. Uh, so welcome, Sister Andrea and Julie. So, um, now that we've all got to know each other, well, um, yeah, I, I just like to give the opportunity to the to our our panel members uh, just to share a bit about their experience of how they feel the connection between growing food and their practice, um, and maybe I'll ask them one or two more questions uh, based on that, uh, and then of course I would like to give the floor uh, to all of you um, to ask your questions. Um, so yeah, whoever feels called called to start, um, please share about uh, your practice of uh, growing food mindfully. Jazz bowing up. So dear friends, uh, Brother Tenzin bowing in from Mountain Spring Monastery in uh, Australia. Uh, the place where I'm sitting uh, is the traditional lands of the Daruk people. And I just like to acknowledge their um, long history of custodianship here, taking care of country and, and allowing me now to have the opportunity to sit, uh, to breathe and walk in this beautiful place. And uh, trying day by day uh, in my own way to start to belong also to this country. So I really um, am grateful for their, for their continued um, custodianship here. So I just wanted to um, get the ball rolling a little bit just to, to uh, yeah, speak a little to that point uh, that Jazz shared my uh, first encounter with natural farming uh, in the book by uh, Masanobu Fukuoka, One Straw Revolution. And the interesting thing for me about that, the experience of reading that book is at the time, even though really folded into that, that tale that he shares is, is a lot of very profound Zen teaching. At the time, all I, all I felt was this really uh, strong aspiration to somehow also grow food. Actually, the, the, the thing that grabbed me was not so much the Zen teaching, which I think at the time was quite over my head and I think still is in many ways it's something that uh, is a lifelong practice of course but I was so struck by the simplicity of his message and actually this quote that we hear quite often about uh, the, um, the, the uh, ultimate goal of farming not being the growing of crops but the cultivation and perfection of human beings it's actually the line just before that in which he says just sow seeds and care tenderly for the plants and soil you have joy and then he goes on to say the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops. So for me, it was this sense of joy and, and uh, kind of uh, connection to abundance, actually, that really drew me to growing food. And it was something that uh, I suppose we are acculturated to try and learn things in a more technical way. And my career took me more into ecology and the study of biodiversity, a much more kind of academic pursuit. But it was actually an experience at the university uh, that I was working at at the time in uh, Southern Norway of connecting again with people who were just coming together around this, this joy of growing food, of connecting with abundance and sharing that abundance. And something about it being sacred and, and really worthwhile. It was reconnecting with that that actually started to allow me to draw away from the academic world. So I'm, I'm really grateful actually for people like all of you who are 
abundance rather than I suppose to the paradigm of scarcity, which is quite a common one in systems, especially a big part of the process. And um, yeah, you also mentioned in the introduction, uh, Jazz, about syntropic farming. For me, this is something relatively new. I'm still really learning about it, but I'm again struck by the uh, return again and again uh, of the the founder Ernst Goetz, uh, a, um, a farmer originally from uh, Switzerland, I believe, who uh, is, has been farming now in in Bahia in Brazil for many years. He returns to this theme of um, of joy uh, and abundance as well. Um, I might just read. I might just read a quote from him, actually. He says, unconditional love and cooperation are the basic principles of inter and infra specific relationships between all species on this planet. It is a fundamental precondition for the syntropic process to occur. That is the process of evolution from simplicity to complexity. The way that we've been acting based on rivalry and cold competition, we are certainly going to hell. It's his strong words. It creates a shortage of resources, conflicts, war, results in bankruptcy and death. Meanwhile, applying unconditional love and cooperation in any situation or circumstance will have positive results. He goes on to say, I can assure you that I've had much success as a farmer in the area that I've worked exactly because I have applied this principle. I have acted in this way. This is how I lived my life. I teach many courses in order to develop machines for farming and invest in research, but my daily sustenance is provided by my farming. I am a farmer, not a sufferer. I do this work moved by internal pleasure and joyful of life. So I just wanted to share that. I found that really inspiring when I read it. And it's something that I uh, aspire to do, even though we're just, uh, as even some of you who are here today will know, we're just taking the first steps to uh, creating a, a farm moving from simplicity towards complexity here at Mountain Spring. But yeah, I, I just wanted to share that. I'm really looking forward to hear what others have to say. And I don't know if I, I um, have anything more to offer at this point, Jazz, but if you have any uh, questions, I know there were some questions from the, um, the sign-up sheet, but maybe there's a moment for those later on. Back to you, Jazz. Thank you, Brother Tenzin. Uh, yeah, we can get to those later. I'll just, uh, we can just go through all the, the panel members and they can share a bit of their story and vision and deep insights. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe Will, you would like to go next? This, I, I see the sisters unmuted. The sisters, do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Dear Thai, dear Sangha, um, Will bowing in from Malaysia. Um, very honored to be here. I feel a little weird because um, despite the fact that uh, the practice has inspired our community farm here in Malaysia, I've never really spoken about it to Sangha members. Uh, I speak about the farm to farmers and friends and and it's pretty separate with, with the Sangha practice that we have in Singapore and, and Malaysia. So this is, this is a bit of two rivers coming together. So a little bit of nerves. Um, so like Jazz mentioned, uh, well, we were in the same Dharma family in 2014 and I, in, in, in Plum Village. And I, I used to sneak down to Happy Farm to volunteer and, and touched uh, composting very deeply uh, as Thai was teaching every day. And the thought that came to my mind when the retreat ended in 2014 was to, was to practice right livelihood. Uh, and so I, I, I resigned from my very corporate job in Singapore and, and came home to, to this little town just across the straits in Malaysia. 
just to be with my family and, and friends. And we started this farm together. So a few things that I think are tying everything together. Uh, uh, we are also a CSA farm, a community supported agriculture farm. So it, the farm is supported by uh, 150 families. Uh, some are cancer patients and, and we donate our excess uh, produce whenever we have it to, to low income households in the neighborhood. Uh, Every day, uh, uh, we, we drive a little truck uh, and we pick up uh, food waste around the city, uh, about 3,000 kilograms from restaurants and hotels and coffee shops. And we, we compost that and we use that to grow our food. And uh, we, we created a, a, a place uh, and hopefully practice, quietly practice the four nutriments. So we, 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 we gather every week to pack the vegetables together, to listen to every, each other's aspirations. We cook together and eat together, good food. Uh, allow our children to, to climb trees, not, not, not very common in the city. <laughs> and, and and just soak in that kind of uh, beautiful environment that, that I remember in, in, in Plum Village. And, and so sort of, I guess I can't be a monk, so I can be half farmer, half monk. You know, that's sort of my aspiration. Yeah. Um, and recently, uh, I've also become a, a student of Ernst Gosch. <laughs> and we have been. Uh, helping friends with land. Um, as some of you may know, in Malaysia, we, we take out a lot of our forests to plant uh, oil palm. And, and so uh, we're working on it with a few friends who have oil palm uh, land to transform that into a syntropic agroforest. Uh, like Brother Tenzin, I'm very, 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 very touched by the syntropic way. Uh, Maybe just to quickly end by, by explaining what we did a few days ago. Uh, a few days ago, we, we took down some palm oil trees. Uh, we shredded them into bits, into mulch. And we planted, so we, we loosened the soil in a line, in tree lines. And rather than planting eight, monoculture oil palm trees in a small piece of land with pesticides and weedy sites. We, we built these little tree lines and we, instead of just eight oil palm trees, we planted something like 500 different trees. And all these trees and plants range from those that grow old after a year, like tapioca and, and, uh, and jack beans and turmeric and ginger with different shade and light requirements all the way to trees that grow to a hundred years like the durian which Thai doesn't like to eat and but also jackfruit and bananas and and we plant so many trees to to help these trees grow as well from a uh, very strong brave trees that grow in bad soil, like acacia to, to uh, eucalyptus, to just trees that can really help these trees grow. And we plant them all together. And, and there's a, there was a lot of joy doing that and seeing how they are so close to one another, but they're sort of sprouting and growing up together, helping each other, shade each other from the wind and the sun and the, the monsoon rain we have here. And, and, and really, really seeing that bad soil, the, the soil that was already degraded, the oil palm soil, and seeing the oil palm transform and becoming mulch and nutrients and, 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 and seeing a, a little food forest coming together. It really reminds me also of our community and, and how open we are and how diverse we are and, and how we help each other grow. Uh, and, and, 
yeah, there's a there's a lot of just a lot of joy watching that happen. The unconditional love that's under underground. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's uh, what I have for now. So thank you for listening. You were bowing up. Okay, thank you, Will. Anybody volunteers to go next? Hello, I would like to continue. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, dear friends, um, it's, it's very inspiring to hear from you. It's wonderful. So it's Andrea bowing in from um, Lower Hamlet at the moment, Plum Village. And um, yeah, what I was thinking of what inspired me when I came to um, Plum Village is um, yeah, to see a monastery and uh, also taking care to, to grow the food, but also together with a mindfulness practice. And I think this was so interesting for me to, um, to see how it is possible to, um, I mean, growing vegetables can also be quite stressful. You're taking care of something alive and then how to bring the mindfulness practice to it. And um, to see, I think, um, for one thing, to learn to grow vegetables, because we, I think we are often so distant from, I think this is all in us. We, we, we know it somehow, but um, yeah, we are, we, we've forgotten it. And um, I think uh, one thing is that uh, there are so much, um, yeah, to emphasize on um, at the same time building brotherhood and sisterhood what we do and I think our building community and um, to do this by growing our food together I think this is uh, really inspiring for me and um, also in Plum Village because I mean not at the moment we are in lockdown but there are so many people coming here and I think it has and probably also with your pro, like with your project, what you just said, uh, dear brothers, it's um, that so many people get inspired and hope from seeing what you can do as one person and how you, uh, what you can set up a garden um, with the mindfulness practice uh, to compost. And um, the same is for um, the community supported agriculture where I work now. Um, like to see it really brings people together when you're not just, you're not growing food and then selling it to them, but um, we are, um, so community supported agriculture means we are, um, we are three gardeners at the moment and growing food for around a hundred people. And they come, um, these are partnerships between um, the producer and the consumers and um, the people they commit for a whole year to uh, to sort, support the farm financially so also our salaries and the seeds and for everything and um, so we share the responsibility like if this is a good year we have a lot of harvest and if it's a bad year then there will be less harvest and um, I think like worldwide there's only one percent of the people are growing the food for like the rest of the world and it's so much pressure um, on them. And this is really a model, I think, for yeah, to, to share the responsibility and the harvest. And also people get more connected. Like when we need help, we can ask them, oh, but today we, um, we have, a, I don't know, we harvest all the pumpkins uh, and people love to come to the farm. And um, I just like people shared, oh, you know, we just founded the CSA like last year, but they say, you know, that I feel more at home now in my town. I already live here for a long time, but now I'm more connected because there's suddenly a group and we, uh, we do things together and we, uh, we take care of the food. So I think for me, this is really a practical, um, so practical to build community together. And, and on the same time, at the same time, it's, for me also to learn this and to grow food it's also very humbling to see i mean i'm i give something to it but in the end the earth the sun the rain it all comes together so it's um i'm just a small part of it and um yeah how abundant how much ab abundance is there um so it kind of it roots me really back very much um, yeah maybe that's for the moment <laughs> thank you
Um, dear friends, <laughs> I, I bow also because um, I, I can continue watching my sisters. Uh, now we are both on the same screen and the same room. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to be here this morning. Uh, thank you, Jess, to organize it. And I'm very, I feel very inspired by all the sharing that I earned so far. Um, so I have been uh, two years happy farmers in, uh, in Plum Village, and now I am at the end of my stay. And um, yeah, I can share what happened to me when I arrived uh, two years ago in New Hamlet. At that time, I, I was back from India and I wanted to, to be a long term there. And, uh, and I arrived and uh, the, uh, one sister asked me to, to work on Happy Farm. And, um, and I shared that I, because they knew me from the previous rent retreat that I did, and I shared that I, I was unable because I didn't have any knowledge. And she shared like, just play. <laughs> she told me, just play. <laughs> and for sure, it was very stressful for me, but it was um, a so amazing gift that I received from the community to have this trust. And uh, with my friend at that time, and also with my team this year, uh, we are both, we are all uh, beginners, but uh, somehow like Plum Village gave us uh, the, the trust and the, um, the space to, to do our best to farm and to, and to practice mindfulness in the garden. And I, and I think it's a great uh, chance uh, to learn uh, and to, to have the time and the space to practice. And, um, Yes, I be, so before being in Plum Village, I I was in India in a reforestation project, and then I met Jazz. I met Jazz, and um, and I remember the the quote of that of that association was um, to plant trees to grow to grow humans, and uh, I remember that I had a, a short conversation with the foundator, and he was like, "Yes, we we can have a more efficient way." Uh, to plant trees, but uh, and to go faster. But our wish is like more to live to to learn to live together, uh, because it was um, a community where we live all together, share all the life together, uh, cook together from the wood that we collect in the forest and we cut in little pieces. So it, it was taking a lot of time at the end the community life. But he was this is the main point. Like for sure. Um, the reforestation aspect is very important, but this is the main point at the end, to learn to live together. And I have the feeling that in Plum Village is what I learned too. Um, I learned a lot about organic farming, but I learned a lot about like uh, to, to work with my sisters. And I'm very grateful because I, I met very amazing people and we, we had the chance to grow together in understanding of the land, but in understanding of ourselves too. And, um, and now we live in a system that most of the farmers, they, they work alone in, on big trucks all day long. And uh, I don't know in around the world, but in France, um, we have a lot of uh, cases of uh, suicides of uh, farmers. Um, like uh, the, the, the last um, numbers was something like uh, one every two days. So it's something quite huge actually. Uh, so, so yes, I, I can see how much uh, it's uh, good conditions. And, um, and also maybe later we will have some time to share a little bit more about the <clears throat> five mindfulness trainings. But for sure, it's very related. And I, especially when I read the fifth one, who is like nourishment and healing, I felt so nourished and healed uh, by this experience. And uh, yes, it's quite amazing when you farm in the silence, uh, just with your hands. And, you, and at some time, sometimes I just um, um, make my head a little bit up and I see the skies and the birds and just the silence. And uh, there is not so much farmers now in France that can, I can, that can farm in this way. Uh, so I, I can see how much is healing uh, for me and how much is healing also for the earth because um, it's taking quite a lot of time to restore the soil. 
uh, thanks to my uh, and sister <laughs> Andrea, who started the farm four years ago. But now in Loha Hamlet, for some technical um, reasons, we have to move the farm. And the next uh, land um, is very, very in poor uh, condition. Mm -hmm. So I can see how much like we will need some healing <laughs> for the land there. And um, so it's, it's very amazing because it's healing inside and outside in the same time. And um, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a very deep uh, practice. And, uh, and when we farm, we, it's difficult to explain, but sometimes we feel that what we do outside is what we do inside. When, I, when I'm very gentle and when I plant some seeds and when I harvest, I have the feeling that I am also taking care of my inner garden and the gentleness that I put inside is also growing in um, outside sorry it's also growing inside so yeah that's why I can that's what I can share uh, shortly about uh, uh, these two years in Plum Village uh, thank you so much for listening dear friends <laughs> thank you for the nourishing sharings so who's next I'm happy to, to go next. This is Mick buying in. You can hardly see my face. I uh, apologize. The, <clears throat> I haven't figured out Zoom. Generally, I'm always in the dark. But there's nice sunshine in the back. So good morning from, from Plum Village. And it's lovely to see so many faces. There's quite a few of us here from some of the different hamlets. I see Sister Lucnium has just appeared on my screen. <laughs> Uh, and also friends from Australia as well as Brother Tinda. I see Melanie and Martina in Ireland. So, uh, yeah, sorry about my fist. No, well, maybe that's a good thing. Anyway, my journey with being here, I, I came to, to live in, in France in Plum Village at the end of 2015 for the start of the Rains Retreat. And I joined the team with Daniel and Stuart, who were the, I call them the, the farm ancestors. And, and you can see their, their sort of, their good seeds also in the Lower Hamlet farm, also over in, in the Lower Hamlet. So after around six to nine months, both those guys were, were heading off into the world and um, I stepped into to the role of responsibility in the farm in, in Upper Hamlet. And my journey to, to be involved in this type of livelihood was, I, I love what Will shared, half farmer, half monk. I think I, I'm gonna steal that because it's, it's sort of our life here. Um, I was quite lost in terms of direction in my life when I, I was lucky enough to have a college education, but didn't really know what to do. And it was only when I got very lucky and I applied for a, a three-year apprenticeship with the there's a conservation charity in the United Kingdom called the National Trust that they bring a lot of strands of, of conservation of heritage together. Um, and so I was being trained a horticulturalist, but also an, an ecologist. And for me, I found a sort of a direction in life. A, we use the word volition, I guess, a, like point me in the right direction. And that gave me amazing experiences to, to be, I lived in the countryside as well. I, I moved out of the city or the urban environment for the first time in my life. I realized I was really happy in that environment. I lived by the sea. We had amazing forests that we were responsible for, for helping to, to manage and care for the ecology and also amazing gardens. Uh, but actually in that training, food wasn't a, bit a part of it. Some of my, my friends who were training in other parts of the United Kingdom, worked with these amazing old vegetable gardens that would be associated with like the old chateaus or old stately homes. And I got to, to taste a little bit of that. And that's really something, there was something a seed in me that wanted to, to move towards food. But my journey sort of in my livelihood went towards very different strands. I think I've, I tasted all different strands of what it was to work in the horticultural industry. Uh, not necessarily agriculture. So I worked for, for quite a few years in, in London. I see Steve also there with some children. <laughs> Steve and Melanie are friends that were, were living in London together at the same time. 
in the Royal Botanical Gardens Kew, which is a sort of an interesting history of colonialism and maybe exploitation, but now doing very good things for botanical conservation. But that wasn't my thing because it's a bit geeky. Uh, and anyway, just to speed up the process, it was really when I re-engaged with food. So I moved back to, to Belfast and I got a job with a small not-for-profit and it was all around community food. And in the North of Ireland, we have a long legacy of uh, conflict. Uh, some people would say civil war and one of the, the, uh, the, sort of the legacies of that is poverty and a lack of education around how to care for oneself what to eat and having access to food was a big part of that. So I worked for five years to, to help build sort of green infrastructure in cities to, to grow food with people and give them the, the simple skills to, to grow food. And then when I uh, happened on my first week in Plum Village after a uh, tie came with the Sangha to Ireland in early, I think it was 2012, I met Daniel and Stuart. And all of a sudden, I was sort of awakening to a possibility of having a spiritual element in my life. But I never conceived that I could have this spiritual element in my livelihood. And the Happy Farm was just, it sort of blew me away, this concept. So I made myself a bit of a nuisance and a bit maybe like Will hung out on the, the farm a little bit and got in the way of probably the, the work that was happening and asking awkward questions at awkward times. And eventually, I found myself joining the team, as I shared. Um, and yeah, I'm so happy that I can live this half monk, half farmer life here. And uh, the farms continue to thrive. Where we're just as under the guests, we're in lockdown. And people talk about the world coming to Plum Village. We're the United Nations of mindfulness. But this year has been a very different year. Uh, but it's been a it's a good year for me to, to settle in because I'm coming back of the new context. I came back at the start of the year full time and the, the, the community are now sort of paving a, a path for some of us who want to, to build our, our lay lives with a simple livelihood. So we're receiving a, a salary, some of us, including myself. And I'm up here in West Hamlet, a little satellite home of, of the community. And yeah, this is my home. This is where I'm putting down my roots. And it's such a privilege to continue with, I remember spending lovely times on the, the farm with Brother Tenzin, with Daniel, with Stuart, with many others. And we, we have these four pillars of the, 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 the project. So we, we grow food and the, the climate here is amazing compared to what it is in, in Ireland or the UK. So we average around 50,000 euros worth of organic seasonal food from the farm here in Upper Hamlet. And every year we try to, to sort of experiment and push the boundaries a bit. So an example of that this year, for the first time, we grew sweet potatoes, which are quite a common crop in Vietnam, but I've never had the possibility to grow them. And it was incredible. The yield was, was huge. And it's all done, like Andrea shared, we're just a, a small element in the, the whole picture. It's the soil, it's the rain, it's the sun. We have a heavy clay soil here, but it's full of nutrients. Um, and we have many, many farmers and many guests who come to, to help us to, to partake in, in that process of, of tending and planting and carrying and harvesting. So there's the, the food growing and then there's the, the community life, which is challenging. I'm not going to, to say otherwise, to, to live together in community is challenging. At the moment, I'm experiencing a challenge with a, a friend in the community. It's just something small, but it's an interpersonal challenge and it's it's sitting with me over the last few days is uncomfortable uh, and we'll have to, to sit together in a few days to, to talk about it and to, to begin anew. But it's, I would have been a conflict avoider in the past and I'm moving towards yeah, the human relationship as well as the, the relationship with the soil and the seeds and the seasons. So we have the community life and then we have the education. So all the farmers, this year we're the smallest we've ever been in terms of the, the team because we're in lockdown. At the end of the year, they should be able to leave if they wish to, to begin their own uh, regenerative, organic, and hopefully mindful farming project. And there's been now eight years of that happening on the on the farm, and as well in, in the lower hamlet and the new hamlet. Um, the other element, then I guess, is the mindfulness practice, and it's this is with like a shared is the key. It's not just mindfulness; it's sort of a deep reverence for 
you know, we're not in a formal practice there. We, we try to practice in a way that there's no, many of you have, have been to the farms in, in Plum Village and experienced it for yourselves. I know, but for others, maybe who haven't, the idea that we cross the threshold of the farm and we see no difference in entering the meditation hall for formal sitting or walking meditation. That we, we practice walking meditation when we're walking around on the farm, wheeling wheelbarrows full of compost or bringing harvest, weeding, all these opportunities, just like Ty says, we can practice when we brush our teeth, when we use the bathroom, when we cycle, when we go up the steps. And it's really also very difficult. And just in the last few days, uh, there's a, a lovely teacher, Ram Das, some of you might know, I'd like to share a quote that we've shared in our circle of the last few days in the upper farm. farm. And he talks, we see it as service meditation rather than working meditation. And Ram Das says, if you're not doing service, in such a way that at the end of the service, you feel freer, higher, clearer, lighter, and more energized. You've got work to do. And that is something that we uh, aspire towards. But after five years of it, I can probably count on my fingers and toes how many times I've finished a session on the farm and felt all those things. So we, we practice stopping with the farm bell to, to really check in with our, our physical state. Are we holding tension in our bodies? Uh, what's our mental state? And checking into the nature, for me, as a bit of a nature junkie, it's amazing. We're surrounded by an oak forest. There's a huge lotus lake. Uh, and the vegetable garden itself is so beautiful. And the herb garden that uh, Brother Tenzin and Daniel were planting, it's still there and looking gorgeous. And also for, for me, we also use one of Ty's books called The Love Letter to the Earth. And we, we read from that nearly at the start of every session, just maybe a paragraph. And it's his, his sort of take, if you want, on deep ecology. And for me as well, it's, it's a farm we produce food, but it's about sharing the space and being okay with sharing the space and sometimes sharing our produce with the other than human. Uh, ecology that are there. So we have deer, we have wild boar, we have this little friend called a koipu, who's an invasive species who likes to eat our kale in the winter. Uh, sometimes we have nuns who are come and pick as well, who are, maybe can be an invasive species sometimes. So we, we have to share. Uh, and looking at it in the lens of deep ecology, there's a beautiful saying from, from Tai, or one sentence, and he says, you carry Mother Earth within you, she is not outside of you. So we try as much as we can to, to really embody that, that deep ecology on the, the land. And yeah, try not to, to think that we have to wait until evening meditation or morning meditation to, to practice. So it's a busy life and it's a, it's a beautiful life and it's a challenging life. And it's, it's just trying to bring the beginner's mind back day after day after day and showing up for, for all the challenges and all the joys and the abundance that, that the earth offers us. And we continue and hopefully we, we look forward to the chance when we can welcome many of you back. The last thing I'll say, I find it so inspiring and I can't wait to hear from Southern Vietnam to hear about the, the other projects that not necessarily flowed from the, the farms in Plum Village, but I know here we can definitely inspire other, other projects because people look towards Plum Village and they look towards the monastic community and, and the farms here to, to see what's going on. And definitely last thing I'll share is we, we've, as a community, we've in Upper Hamlet uh, purchased quite a, a significant amount of new land bordering the farm. And half of that we're going to be regenerating into native forest. And the other half is marked for agricultural projects. So we, we may, it's a long-term project, uh, in terms of just capacity and finances, develop it into an agroforestry project. So working with, you know, we have a bakery here this morning. We were able to enjoy fresh bread that was baked the night before in a wood-fired bed oven. We'd be able to grow some of our cereals, some of our wheat, some of our spelt, some of our rye, but also have avenues of apricot trees or persimmon trees, hazelnut trees, and maybe even bringing in the centropic elements as well in a temperate climate would be a lot of fun. So thank you all for being here, and that's enough for me. Bye, out. Thank you, Brother Mick. Don't worry about the lighting. We can see your true beauty easily. <laughs> so we've learned that nuns are an invasive species in Upper Hamlet. I don't know what uh, the sisters have to say about that. <laughs> but, uh, 
Let's go over to Vietnam. I'm most excited to hear from all our friends down there. Xin chào. So hello from Vietnam. I'm very, very happy and we're very happy to be here and uh, to meet you and uh, talk and share with you. So my name is Hang. I started Nui Thu Project uh, in 2016. Um, it, uh, it provides a free education and training for local children. Um, we teach them English, uh, leadership, business skill and other um, um skill as well um so we have about 50 children uh, now um about six years old to 18 years old um, um so these are the groups that are teenagers um we have a small garden about 2000 square meters uh, we try to grow a lot of plants and uh vegetables and fruits to provide for the team and for the tourists who come and enjoy, because we have also we, we do also eco tourism uh, here as well. Um, um, so what we do right now is we have a group of about twenty teenagers. We uh, they will be in the team. So each team will have like three uh, three kids and uh, take care about five plants. So they are very excited about uh, farming and learn how to make fertilizer. Uh, how to work with the soil and take care of the plants. Um, yeah, so Nguyen uh, uh, <laughs> is uh, my hometown, so I'm, I'm uh, feel uh, motivated to do this job. Um, years and years, I still like uh, love doing this, and uh, I like being around with children. And, um, Talking about big things like people talk about pollution and uh, climate change, um, a lot of things like this. But um, um, and uh, how to say um, we um, I don't I don't really see like people really taking action, and I see the children are the um, the main thing to. Excuse me, we have a big truck coming, <laughs> so we will pause a little bit. <laughs> That's her father truck. <laughs> Just more. Uh, so, um, so I believe that, um, if we do this, uh, we need some change. We need we have to change the thing in our next generation. So I'm very keen on and uh, passionate in teaching them and nurturing them, um, uh, because they are the future. They are um, many of them uh, are whose parents are farmers. So if we can influence them, we can bring some positive change and uh, nurture them, develop them. They will. Uh, contribute remarkably in our uh, change in our world. Um, so, um, um, so we try, so I, we hope to, um, uh, to do this. I also need more help like uh, financial support, volunteer. So if you can help us to spread the idea and to have more people come and support us. Um, so the team, me and bring another uh, teacher, work quite hard like every day from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., even 10 p.m. because at night we also have to support some uh, children with mental mental problems. Um, also, we do like gratitude and sharing in the evenings about 30 minutes each day to share our feelings to uh, um, practice our uh, uh, kindness and respect. Um, and learn and talk and listen to others. Um, so yeah, so maybe uh, some of them can share about uh, their feeling or <laughs> how they like working in the farm. Please, please. 
Uh, hello, my name is Jen and I'm 13 years old. Hi. Uh, I feel very happy doing gardening. Sometimes I get tired. Uh, sometimes it feels interesting and especially learn a lot of things about uh, things from gardening. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everybody. I'm Link. I'm 13, uh, I'm 13 years old, Sling Jan. And uh, now I will share about my time in the garden. Uh, and I blend. blend Vegetable uh, is a sustainable sustainable farming garden. So I use a uh, first fertilizer, fertilizer, uh, as oh, yeah. oh. and uh, our compost for the soil. It's so difficult and tired for cultivate the soil, but. I feel very happy and uh, I can smile all the day to see my baby child grow up. Thank you. Hello, my name is Han. I'm 13 years old. Mm, I, feel, I feel very fun when I'm playing trees. I'm very tired but very fun. Mm, and I can learn how to plant trees, make fertilizer, and I feel you miss very much. <laughs> Thank you for your uh, beautiful bells of mindfulness. And we learned that in uh, in uh, rural Vietnam, they have trucks the size of airplanes. <laughs> um, so I have one question I'd like to ask, and, and you can just sort of answer popcorn style, whoever feels uh, called to answer, and then we can open it, the floor uh, for other questions from whoever is attending. Um, some people already touched upon it, but uh, I'd like to hear a bit more, like how do you see uh, the connection between the practice of growing food in a sustainable way and uh, our mindfulness practice, like, do you feel it's linked to, for instance, the, the five mindfulness trainings, which talk about reverence for life, nourishment and healing? Do you see it as a realization of interbeing? Um, we also have this beautiful quote uh, from Brother Tenzin that the, or was it from Fukuoka? That the goal of farming is to perfect human is not is to perfect human beings. Um, so yeah, um, how do you see? Please please elaborate a bit more uh, on that. Whoever feels called, jazz bowing up. Uh, dear friends, it's uh, Tenzin bowing in once again from Mountain Spring. Uh, 
I just feel moved to share just to, in the sense of kind of going around the circle a little bit. Thank you all so much for your sharings. It's so beautiful to hear from you all and to, to connect again in some way with the, the uh, atmosphere of the happy farm. It's, it's, uh, uh, feels, feels a really important place in my heart, the happy farm, my experience there. And I think something that uh, for me is really alive in my practice here at, at um, Mountain Spring, uh, where we are, as, as Jazz mentioned, in the process of uh, actually kind of rehabilitating a, a, a farm uh, that was donated to the community for the purpose of building a practice center. But we, I mean, we have a kind of an imperative to uh, actually have a, a viable agricultural enterprise here just to do with the zoning. I won't go into the details, but, but we are sort of obliged to have a farm. If we wish to have a practice center, we need to also have a farm. Uh, luckily, this is something that for me goes hand in hand. And, and it's for all of those reasons that, that you've been sharing and that, Jazz, you, you mentioned just now, the, the very fact of the trains about my consumption uh, lead, uh, I think, to look towards ways to change or to remember how we used to grow and, and share food. But um, in the process of this um, rehabilitation or, or kind of um, renovation of, a, of an existing farm, there is some infrastructure here. We have amazing soil. Uh, I'm, I always find my eyes, uh, Sister Julie mentioned that, that moment when you lift your head up and remember to look at the sky and hear the birds. And, and uh, Mick, you mentioned that this is one of the pillars of the practice in the happy farm, remembering, uh, well, taking the time to come back, not just to the the wilderness inside but looking outside as well um, to, to check in with nature so my eyes are drawn to the forest which lies below the the um the ridge where mountain spring farm is and it's been a refuge for millennia we are within a, a few hundred meters from uh, the border of a national park which uh, in which i don't know if, if any of you have heard of the wallamai pine it's an ancient araucarian ancient conifer found in the fossil record from millions of years ago that has persisted in these refugial forests near Mountain Spring up until this day. And it's the processes that are going on in those forests that actually, in a way, I'm connecting to when I'm on the, on the farm, when I'm moving uh, between the rows that we've planted and, and it, at this stage, really, as, as uh, Hung and uh, the Nui Tung team, hello, mentioned, uh, working with the soil is such an important thing. It's, it's um, so inspiring to hear those young people in, in Vietnam talking about this, this, this return to an understanding of, of the importance of what's going on beneath the soil, what we cannot actually see unless we know how to look. And for me, it's that interbeing, it's that reconnecting to the, this um, uh, ongoing process of uh, mutual support, not not necessarily competition, as Will mentioned. The, the, one of the, the the cornerstones in syntropic approach to farming is recognizing that there is an incredible amount of cooperation and and a movement of unconditional love actually behind so much of this this life that will grow if we know how to water the seeds, how to plant them. So yeah, for me, it's a big a big part of that is is actually uh, cultivating the soil mycelium. Uh, in for me, are a beautiful metaphor for this. There's this sense of of uh, interconnectivity that that disregards boundaries between species, that connects the roots of one tree not just to its offspring in the same species, but to other species. The sense of mutual support. So yeah, for me, it's very firmly in the domain of interbeing that the practice really comes alive, uh, and and that, as as others have shared, really informs the the process, the ongoing process of learning how to live together as human beings as well in community uh, on the earth with with non-human uh, beings but also with one another yeah i find that really important part of the practice it is hard work uh, and that that fatigue in body i think is is one that i'm really familiar with as well many have mentioned but but i think i can also yeah start to touch sometimes that uplifting of the spirit which you shared about nick which i think is is uh, yeah what what we are really here for after all so yeah thanks everyone for for being here and why well, i feel like i've learned so much and i just want to i just want to put a vote in i, I hope you're going to ask us later on jazz but yes let's make this a series i would love to hear so much more
Tenzin Bang, yeah. Don't give away my surprises yet. <laughs> Maybe take a chance to share Bruce Lee again, or maybe not Bruce Lee. Apologies if it's not Bruce Lee. <laughs> Nick again from Upper Hamlet in the dark. <clears throat> uh, one aspect of the, the year here has been the lockdown. And when I stepped into the role of responsibility from Daniel and, and Stuart, the guys had a really intelligent system where they, they planned our, our food production for the times when we were sort of a, a full house of guests. And if you've been to Plum Village, a full house of guests in Upper Hamlet could look like three to 400 people. And then days when we're together across the three hamlets, it could be, you know, normally at Christmas and New Year, we would prepare for, uh, it could be a thousand people coming together to celebrate Christmas Day and New Year's, New Year's Eve. So there's a lot of people to feed. So th there was questions about when, the lockdown happened, what are we going to do in, in terms of our production plan for the year? Uh, are we going to change? Are we going to modify? And this, yeah, people have lots of opinions. Generally when it comes to slugs, that's when I find people have a lot of opinions in, in farming, people who maybe never really engage in gardening or farming. Everyone has an opinion on how to control slugs. But this year in, in the community, everybody had an opinion about what we should do with our production plan. So half said you should really scale back and you know just enjoy the the ride of the the, the schedule, the practice schedule, and enjoy that that time to practice. And then the other half of the community were freaking out, saying, "Oh my God, the, the global food systems are going to collapse. You have to start to grow everything. How how can you start to grow basmati rice in France? Um, how can we get our, our spicy pepper sauce? You know because." Those things are going to disappear after the, the larder runs dry. And after a while, we, we just decided actually to stick with our plan. And one thing about the, the joys of the, the farm here is that we were shielded in many ways from the commercial reality that many farmers have to experience, what, what Andrea experienced, what Will experienced as a community supported agriculture. That's that's half of, of the, the project. So as a farmer, we have to be not just a grower or not just uh, someone who can maybe work well with others in a team, but you have to also market yourself. You also have to, to set yourself out in terms of setting out your stall literally and, and market uh, how you organize in a CSA to get those shares, to get those households to pay up in advance monthly or yearly. Uh, and then, yeah, I remember Daniel talking about like farming in Kansas and America and going to market maybe twice a week. You're getting up at the crack of dawn, setting up, and you're in competition with with many other people who are really striving to do uh, to work in a, a way that's is in harmony with nature. And it's it's hard because we're not to get political. We're in a a capitalist system, and we all want to to break even, and it's really hard. So one thing for for us here is that we we don't have to engage in that commercial reality. Everything we produce goes to the community. And this year, one of the joys is that we worked really well with the, the brothers in Upper Hamlet who have the responsibility to, to be the shopper. I know Sister Lutnium for many years was one of the shoppers as well as the mentor, the monastic mentor for the Lower Hamlet uh, Happy Farm and did a great job to, to have harmony so that there's no duplication of what we're growing and cultivating in terms of what's being bought in. And in the past, that's been a challenge actually across cultures and across languages. Uh, and when we introduced new crops, when we introduced a few years ago ch chard and kale, the, some of the, the cooking teams, they didn't really know what to do with it. So sometimes our produce would linger in the, the refrigerators and, and you know, sometimes small amounts of waste would happen. And that's, that's quite hard to, to observe. But every year and year as the farm culture has become more and more embedded and permanent, nothing's permanent, but it's certainly in the, the DNA of the Plum Village community. The, the waste is less and the, the buy-in from the community is more. So the point I was going to make is that the shoppers this year in Upper Hamlet were fantastic. So we have Shanha Temple, which is maybe 20 to 30 residents and Brothers and Leigh. And Upper Hamlet at the moment is around 70 between Leigh and, and Brothers. And we, we worked well so that we, 
we really scaled back what we were able to to buy or what we chose to buy from from the wholesalers. So we can't produce things like basmati rice. Obviously, we can't grow coffee. We can't grow uh, many aspects of things that we we cook with and eat. But our produce was more than half this year of, of what was produced and what was cooked and what was put into the bowls of the monastic and lay community in Upper Hamlet. And it was really beautiful because another element was the, the brothers realized that we were, were stretched in terms of a farm team, because it's, we all, it's been expressed, it's hard and sweaty and loving work, but stressful work to be a farmer. Because we do it, we're a no-till farm here. So we have a lot of organic matter being manually put on by hand onto the, the beds. It's been four years since we switched to, to no-till. Um, and normally we would have a volunteer culture. Some of you would come for a month to, to, to join the, the farms, but with lockdown, it's not possible. So the brothers uh, seen this and actually it came from the abbot, which was fantastic, that they, every two weeks, the, the monastics would come to the farm and join us. And for me, this was like a dream because it's a reality that it's not everybody's gig to be a regenerative farmer. For, for us, we're here this morning gathering or this afternoon or evening, wherever you are, because we were passionate about this and it's, it's something that we want to engage in. But for many people, they, I see this in community, they may be really interested and passionate about what they eat and what they consume for their own health. But there's a disconnect sometimes with the cultivation of the food and how it's grown and and the, the journey that it takes to get into their, their bowls or into their bellies. So this year we had every two weeks, groups of 20, 20 brothers coming down really for the first time in the history of the Happy Farm consistently to join. And many who are there open to, to learn and did this boundary that is visible between monastic and lay merged. The farm has always been a lay led project in Plum Village. We have a lot of autonomy and a lot of space to be creative, but we, we still live in the monastery. So this was a great way of building the fourfold sangha and, and coming together. And we also continued up until lockdown to, to go to, you know, the, the farms would support one another by swapping every two weeks. The, the sisters and brothers would take turns to go to Lower Hamlet Farm or Happy Farm in Upper Hamlet and have lunch together or have dinner together in the evening. And to continue that that thread's been going for years, but to have the monastics for me that was a big, yeah, a really happy success story, and I think that will that culture will continue. And now there's 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 more buy-in, there's more awareness, and we're even considering, or I'm even considering, offering like a very light class about for the brothers how how to go about cultivating food together, if they're interested to do that. You know, maybe just an hour workshop over a couple of months throughout the growing season. So we'll see if, if that's a possibility. But yeah, it's so, so nice to hear these, these inspiring stories. I loved hearing from Vietnam for all of you there. It's, it's amazing to it really waters the seeds of, of bodhicitta in me and makes me realize that I'm very fortunate to be on this path and on this, in this community. I can't wait to, if, if I can consciously travel to the other side of the world to, to come and visit the Mountain Spring Farm and see, see all these amazing projects manifest with such abundance. Thank you all. Thank you, Brother Mick. I'm gonna interrupt briefly. Um, on the invitation, we said this would take an hour and a half, but I kind of already had in mind that this might take it longer. So I definitely feel the, I definitely want to go on for at least half an hour longer. Um, I don't know how uh, that is for you all. Um, maybe you can, uh, you can uh, give a thumbs up or, well, if you need to go, you can go, it'll be recorded. Um, I don't know if there's any of the panelists that need to go sooner, maybe then they can share first. Um, this is uh, Jazz bowing up. Uh, Tenzin just bowing in briefly. Uh, yeah, I will need to uh, step out a little bit before eight o'clock. We have our other, uh, the Compassionate Ocean uh, Sangha is meeting online as well this evening, but um, I feel like I've had uh, plenty of time to share and, and uh, really looking forward to listening to, to others. 
what you have to say. Tenzin bowing out. A wheel bowing in, dear Sangha. Uh, like everyone, I'm very, very, very touched to to listen to everyone's sharing, and and how we, as a as a sangha, we 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 have that same aspiration, and to see the, the, the kids in Vietnam, and it's always been my aspiration to visit, Sister Hung. Uh, we're not we're so close yet so far, <laughs> so hopefully we can uh, we can meet soon. And um, just reflecting on, on Brother Jess's question, um, I, I mean, there's just so much to say about how farming and our practice are so intertwined and inter are, like, like Brother Tenzin and you know, Brother Mick has shared. Uh, the one that comes up for me now is, is actually true love. Uh, it's, it's very, I guess, growing food regeneratively. It's, uh, for me every day, it's like an invitation to practice true love. It's easier. Uh, it's a little bit like a non-human Sangha. Uh, you, when, when you look at, like today I was, uh, putting some mulch on a mangosteen tree and and the trees, the, the, the little seedling uh, sapling is just inviting, inviting me to be kind, yeah. uh, to give it some, some mulch so that it can protect its soil, her, the soil around her. And, and, and everywhere we go, we see a little insect or we accidentally, you know, heard an earthworm and, and we feel the pain. <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, it's always inviting us to to be kind, and 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 I find that that I'm very grateful that that Mother Earth is is giving us that invitation every time. Um, and maybe I, I'm not sure. I, I have a feeling that all of us share the pain as well. Uh, the more we understand how uh, Mother Earth has has created complex ecosystems to support our life. And the more we understand how we are not really respecting that, the more pain we feel when we see a, when we see a field of monoculture corn or uh, pesticides being sprayed on, on oil palm uh, or weedy sites being used to, to clean up land. Uh, the more we understand in farming, the more we feel the pain, the deep ecological pain. And, and I think that pain is, is also also an invitation for us to want to relieve it. And, and that's how I, I, I feel on certain days as I drive to, to the, the farming project that we are working on. Uh, I see monoculture and, and the more I see it, the more I feel the pain and the, the, the volition to, to do my best uh, within my, my own practice to, to relieve that pain. And that, that, that is such an easy way to practice compassion uh, to cover the soil instead of killing it to, you know, and, and, and to come from that pain. And, and we spoke a lot about joy already. Um, the one that really touches me deeply is actually in inclusiveness. Um, I, I came from, I used to have this idea that humans are destroying nature. We, 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 our actions are, are separate and Mother Earth will be fine without us. The, the trees will be happily growing, the wild, the wilderness will come back. And, and you know, if only we disappeared, uh, uh, everything will come back. Uh, but I realized, uh, uh, you know, when learning agroforestry that, that actually Mother Earth is calling us, is including us. Uh, asking us to, to use our gifts, our gift of awareness, our gift of being able to organize organic matter, our gift of uh, understanding that uh, 
that a turmeric plant needs some shade from, uh, from a tree or understand observing our gift of observing that, that a cassava plant can be planted at an angle to loosen the soil for a tree. Uh, you know, Mother Earth is actually inviting us to be included in the regenerative ecosystem, uh, to, to, to be part of it and to use our, our gifts uh, and to live in, in that, that, that ecosystem, the new, new ecosystem, rather than to live outside of it and, and to blame others for, for, for destroying. Yeah, so, 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 so the practice of inclusiveness is, is again so easy when we, mm, we walk onto a land and we, we can feel that uh, we have a role to play just like uh, the monkeys have a role to break some branches to let some sunlight in or the wild boar has the role to play by rolling in the mud to create a pool of water that feeds the roots or a, or a bird has a role to spread some papaya seeds. Uh, we, we also have our role using the gifts that have been given to us and, and that makes me feel less lonely and less lost and, and, and uh, on the path. <laughs> so that's, that's, so really it's a, it's a, it's a love affair, <laughs> a true love affair. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, Andrea bowing in. Um, I feel very connected. I'm very happy to hear from you all. Um, actually, I don't want to share more, but I would also be interested to hear maybe from the participants, like um, maybe I, I guess there are a lot of people also involved in projects and if they feel like sharing, I would be also happy to hear from you. Just, yeah. Yeah, I think as Brother Tenzin already said, We'll probably do a, a this similar session um so where we can maybe from a slightly different angle but um if, if you don't all get to share today um we hope to create more space also um because uh, already six people sharing it uh, <laughs> it's it's already uh, hardly enough time for you guys to share uh, but of course if anyone really feels like they want to share something they're welcome So, um, Jazz bowing in again. I don't know if any anyone anyone wants to share about the question about uh, the link with the practice. Uh, I see Julie making a move. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Jazz. I I feel happy to share a bit about this. Um, uh, I I wanted to share a bit about the five mindfulness trainings. And especially maybe the first one when we talk about reverence for life. And it's uh, very related to um, the sharings that we heard before. Uh, but what touched me is that when I, when I, yesterday I was reading it and I, and I read again, um, seeing that harmful actions arise from anger, fear, greed, and intolerance, which in turn come from dualistic and discriminating thinking. And, um, it's, it's, um, I can see that it's very uh, in our culture, uh, at least in France, maybe in the West, maybe uh, uh, human culture, I don't know, <laughs> that in this moment, like we see um, a bit the nature as uh, something that we have to fight against uh, or to use it, but there is this kind of uh, fear somehow. And it's very related to the fear of, uh, missing food and the fear of natural disasters. Um, 
and I and I can see that for me in in my in my farming, I, this uh, this fear can rise up uh, easily when I see that uh, there's a lot of uh, bugs on the plants, like uh, we had uh, an invasion of dorifor on our potatoes, and I saw. Um, a deep fear inside of me coming about the, the, my ancestor, like to have hunger, you know, <laughs> and um, and I think I, I can see for me it's very important to cultivate the insight of interbeing uh, because in uh, in that training they see that I uh, I am committed to cultivating the insights of interbeing and compassion and um, to see that we are, we are very related. And uh, when we farm, it's not uh, about to, to use or to, to plan in, in, in order that we can take from the earth, but very to work with. And from what uh, my brother share, uh, shared earlier, um, uh, it's, it's a love affair. And uh, <laughs> our teacher is very often saying that um, true love comes from uh, true understanding. And uh, I can see that uh, by uh, farming, I understand more and more uh, nature. And I understand more and more how I'm related uh, to it, uh, to her, to Mother Earth. And, um, and that I, I, am, I feel more and more safe and relaxed. <laughs> I feel more and more embraced. And I feel more and more that I'm not separated and that I can, I can trust. And that um, farming is very taking care. And uh, even if we have to produce, um, I can I can always come back to this training to 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 realize that um, I'm I'm inter uh, with nature, and that I I'm safe and I and and nothing can come from dualistic thinking if I'm thinking that I. I'm something else, uh, it, it cannot work. Uh, and it's bringing up uh, this kind of, as I shared, anger, fear, greed, and intolerance. And uh, it's basically what is happening a little bit in this moment with like uh, massive farming. There's uh, greed and there is some fear to miss. So we produce much more than what we need and we stock and after we waste. And, um, and I can see for me, it's very important to heal myself uh, inside of me that, uh, that fear, because otherwise I will fall or I will do whatever action in my life in the same um, thinking, uh, come from the same place of uh, greed and, and fear. So, so yes, for me, it's very important for myself to heal that and, uh, in order to be a happy farmer. <laughs> um, Thank you for listening. Uh, dear friends, um, in the interest of keeping things rolling, I'll, I'll uh, be so bold as to bow in again. I'm, I'm feeling moved just to speak a little bit to the the physicality of of the practice for me which is something i i come from a background in in uh, movement practice as well yoga has been something that's a very important part of my practice for for quite some time and and um a few of us have shared about the, the physical fatigue the hard work involved uh, in in farming and and it's something that i um really look to explore as an opportunity also for mindfulness of the body uh, the body in motion and ways to work with um, the asymmetries of tension in the body when I'm when I'm using implements down on the on the farm here uh, to to take the time to stop and look at what the what the energy is behind my movement and whether I'm feeling uh, that there is kind of like a, a really like a goal on oriented uh, uh, type of um, uh, approach or if I'm actually able to relax I often find I mean just to to give an example I often find when I'm using a, a hoe uh, that most of the energy I waste is 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 in trying to move quickly between the gestures that that are doing the actual work it's it's not it's not the act of moving the earth it's me trying to rush to do it again if that makes sense so I really find there's a lot of interesting space that opens up when I'm able to approach every movement not just the one where I'm 
filling the the you know the 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 the, the stroke of the hoe that gathers the earth, but also the stroke that is returning the hoe to its starting position. This kind of thing for me is really interesting domains for a practice of mindfulness of the body uh, in motion. And actually I have a really beautiful quote. I don't know how many Tolstoy fans there are in the, in the group this evening, but <laughs> if you have the time, I don't know, lockdown maybe is a good time to start, but uh, this is actually from Anna Karenina and uh, it's, um, Levin, one of the main protagonists in that tale, uh, one of one of many, as always in Tolstoy, but uh, and it reads: After he's taken, he's actually taken a moment to look around at the countryside, as some have shared. A really beautiful practice. The longer Levin mowed, the oftener he felt the moments of unconsciousness, in which it seemed not his hands that swung the scythe, but the scythe mowing of itself, a body full of life and consciousness of its own. And as though by magic, without thinking of it, the work turned out regular and well finished of itself. These were the most blissful moments. So yeah, that takes me back. I, I don't know if Mick can remember the moment scything down on the happy farm back in the day, and then that's how we were accumulating our carbon for the composting. <laughs> but it's something that I still do here at Mountain Spring. I have never, I have never um, left that that uh, uh, I, I suppose that interest in finding ways to to slow down and, and uh, uh, take the time to find a movement that's, that's at the same time efficient, but also is possible to be blissful. Uh, and yeah, just uh, very briefly, and I'll have to apologize and bow out quite soon, unfortunately. Um, it it's kind of connects for me to a question or at least a part of a, a quite a beautiful question and sharing that was posted uh, in, in the sign up process. Uh, and it's, yeah, I'll, I'll start by telling a, a little story, actually, that well, I had the, the good fortune to spend some time at a retreat center in the Tibetan tradition in southern Australia um, on a, a farm or a, a, a retreat center that had been a farm um, for many years. Uh, it went through various manifestations as an ashram and as a healing and wellness center and then as a kind of a, a commune in the traditional sense. And the original founder, the farmer, uh, who was a, I think, five time gold medal winning uh, organic garlic farmer, uh, had been farming in the area for 40 years. The founder, he still lived nearby and he drove a ute uh, in, in Australia. We call this is like a, a vehicle with a tray back, you know, it's like a utility, something that every farmer needs. And the license plate read Yoga One. And I would see him driving up and down our shared driveway many times. And I gradually got to know him a little better. And uh, he sort of became a mentor. Uh, so generous with his time and eventually I asked him so tell me Fred is his name what's with the license plate and he said oh yeah I'll tell you about that someday and I'll uh, and he, he had a laugh he always liked to have a joke and anyway um, uh, this yoga one license plate stuck with me and then eventually by and by I got him to come and help me with some uh, uh, tilling of the soil we hadn't moved yet to the no till we were still in the kind of the till phase and he came down the hill with his tractor and um, we did this amazing work together. And then, and then he pointed and he pointed to the, the license plate of the tractor. And he said, remember you were asking me about the, the, um, the license plate, like why yoga one? He said, well, I, I did that just to remind people that hard work is yoga two. And he pointed over and the license plate on the tractor was yoga two. So he had, he had it like right there for us. But I just wanted to finish by saying, in speaking to this, the question that has been posted in the chat, uh, as well, and uh, I'm not sure if I'm understanding quite the, the the main emphasis of that question, but the one that was posted in the sign up process regarding the kind of how to make this um, kind of path that we're on sustainable in in an economic sense as well as in a spiritual sense. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, the access to good mentorship for me has been absolutely invaluable like it's it's a very very difficult path the, the path of of making food production make sense financially in the the completely senseless economic model that the the larger world is living in for me main ingredients there in living in community of course you know the, the support that you have spiritually and emotionally but also financially from being embedded in community super important that we could talk about this a lot. And I've actually asked, I currently also have a, an amazing mentor here at Mountain Spring, a, a local market gardener 
uh, he, he spoke uh, quite movingly to this question when I posed it to him, the one that was posted in the, in the um, sign up regarding how to make, uh, how to meet these obstacles which, which uh, come up for so many, uh, especially young people starting out on the path of, of regenerative agriculture where you know they experience burnout and that it just the bottom lines don't add up and he he said yeah it's really difficult but you know if you're going to go out there you need a you need a, also a business mind and this takes time there's skills there that, that are important to learn and um th that it's a it's a real challenge and it's not just it's not just regenerative farming that has this high failure rate it's right across the board so to um i think be be realistic about that but he also said, take heart. He knows many farmers who've been in the game for years and years practicing regenerative practices, and they're still there. They, they, have, they have survived and grown and flourished 40, 50 years in, in the industry. So it is, it, it is possible it can be done. And I believe that even in the group here today, there's people who also are modeling not only that, but that it can be done in a way that is regenerative in the sense of spiritually healing as well, as, as our sisters and others have shared beautifully that that there's, there is something that we can touch that's, that's healing for our relationship with not only one another, but also with the planet uh, at the same time. So I really take heart from that. And I just want to yeah, reiterate mentorship is super important, super important. And uh, well, I look forward to being able to connect again in this kind of forum with, with you know, some, some in, a, in a sense, I feel like we are one another's mentors in that, you know, we, we, uh, tread a similar path, we meet similar obstacles and we can offer support and insight. So thank you so much all for listening and um, to Jazz once again for, for organizing uh, and to the, the team at Nutung uh, to, to take the time to all come together. Yeah, thank you so much. Also, that was really, really beautiful to, to see you all there. And uh, I miss you all. And I really look forward to the opportunity to go back I, I can't say enough. If 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 the conditions arise, get yourself to Nutong to to see the work that they're doing there. And if not, let's try and support them as much as we can um, from a distance. Uh, look for their website and uh, yeah, really get behind the work that they're doing there. It's amazing. Thank you all. I might have to bow out just um, on this on the on the quiet in a few moments to go to our other session. Um, thank you, Brother Tenzin, and uh, uh, yeah, you're, um, you're most welcome. Thank you also to the technology, which is uh, keeping up so far. Um, yeah, in the interest of time, um, so I feel there is a lot more that can be shared, so we definitely have to continue this at some point. Um, and we haven't even gotten to the questions of uh, all the people who've been listening in. Maybe we, maybe... Um, other people, specifically the ones who are not in a monastic environment, because um, there was this question in the chat about how to make, yeah, about the economic viability of farming, um, which can be very stressful. Uh, it was Katie who shared uh, how to practice bringing this to a commercial environment where the pressure to make profit from your produce is present. And also in the sign up, we had a question um, from um joseph who shared um yeah it's it's very hard uh, to compete in this market because um regenerative agriculture you know people say oh it's too expensive and then they go for the you know for the for the non-regenerative non-sustainable agriculture and it's very hard to compete uh in this world um so maybe um sister andrea we haven't heard too much of you yet maybe you would like to share or uh, um, yeah, Jazz, uh, bowing up. Um, yeah, maybe it's, I also would like to share that, um, and because when we were talking about like the work, how that's physically exhausting. And I also have this when I'm maybe alone on the field and with all the weeds and it seems kind of just too much. And I can feel the despair rising how to do this. And actually, I notice now how, how it's really uh, watering my joy and um, 
um, feeling of connection because then when you're on on your own on the field and think well actually what what difference do I make or is it really does it has an impact and now to share with all of you and to hear from you um, it um, it gives me so much hope and joy um, and I think this is so important and um, especially that we are such an international group right now it's uh, it's wonderful um, yeah, to hear that we are all doing our um, our part in different kinds of the world and um, yeah I think uh, for me it's very nourishing to hear to hear that and um, yeah because I think um, yeah our work uh, it's fulfilling but it's hard and um, so I think we need the connection to know uh, we can make a difference and we make a difference and um, yeah to hear from others so this is actually um, thanks a lot Jess for bringing us all together here um, and well I'm uh, I really uh, I, I know that with commercial farming it's I think it's so much more difficult and I think um, the like the community supported agriculture, community based agriculture, that's a good, I think it's a, someone said it's a, a way to unlearn capitalism. And I really like this. It's, um, it's still, I mean, I feel also a lot of uh, responsibility to, to grow enough food for, for the members, but it's another way of doing it. So I really want to um, encourage you. I think it's since the 70s, it's a, a worldwide movement starting in Japan and um, yet yeah, to look for something or start something similar, um, to look it up, community-based agriculture, what it means and where you have possibilities in your own country. And I mean, it's already a movement for a long time, but I think in the last five years and with the climate change movement, uh, um, I think there are a lot of those things starting and um, yeah, to take part in this and to support it, um, it's a good way. And I mean, this is still like how to bring the practice and um, this is another way maybe to, to see with your sang Sangha members what you can do. Yeah, so thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, Sister Hang, are you there? I uh, see the room is empty. Um, <laughs> there she is. Would you like to uh, add anything, Sister Han? Uh, sorry, we have still not just come again. So wait, maybe wait a few, a few minutes, a few seconds. Yeah, it's about mindfulness. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so Uh, sorry for lost. Uh, I, I I lost the conversation because I the children left and start to work in the farm, so I need to be there to uh, instruct them. <laughs> um, but I uh, thank you so much for the session today. Uh, the children like uh, seeing and meeting people uh, all over the world, and they are very excited. Um, they. Uh, uh, they want to listen up more, but their English still uh, need to be improved. Um, um, so, um, what else? <laughs> I don't know what it is. <laughs> Sorry, uh, again, another one is coming. Another uh, machine is working. <laughs> um, you want to share anything about your practice? with the uh, farming, like some last words? Um, from my farming. Um, so um, my parents are farmer. They grow um, a lot of the durian, like food trees mainly. Um, and now they still use uh, pesticides. <laughs> they know it's not good, but they still use it. Um, they try to start uh, 
something uh, more sustainable, um, but not a lot. Um, so, and why I'm trying to tell them and to teach the children about um, converting into more sustainable uh, things. Um, so we here we in our uh, garden we grow about uh, sixty plants: uh, banana, durian, uh, vegetables, aloe vera, and other herbs. Um, uh, so um, every day after the English class, the children will be in the farm and work about one uh, thirty minutes to one hour. And so they take turn to care for their group. And uh, we also uh, work with a partner in Ho Chi Minh City to deliver the produce. Um, and uh, we use the, uh, the money to, uh, to sponsor the best team, the best group of students that uh, contribute uh, to the garden. Uh, in terms of um, uh, leadership, a uh, teamwork, um, um, quality, something like that. And uh, the children are so excited in farming, they even don't want to be in the class, but just just, just to put time on the garden only. <laughs> so I have to balance them between uh, classes and farming. Uh, yeah, so um, we are very happy here and uh, uh, enjoy each day with uh, the children improvement with the food as well um, and with the atmosphere and with the friendship uh, and uh, we're happy to see the little thing growing each day and uh, yeah <laughs> just seem more happy and uh, enjoy with hard work of course uh, and uh, so sad that this year we can we, we don't have people come a lot um, but um, it's kind of, we have time for ourselves. Um, even for me, I have time to uh, more exercise and personal time more. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> just, I don't know, but uh, I'm very excited and uh, we will share on the Facebook group um, when we have more plans and uh, the uh, reduction. So we will share the the things that we have on the Facebook so everyone can see and enjoy and maybe you can come to see us next year. And thank you for our will to uh, uh, share that you will come <laughs> when maybe when the lockdown is over. And uh, of course, uh, rather Alex Ten Tenzin and uh, I'm very happy that you come back uh, to see us. We are uh, the children still remember you and want to see you here. Um, Whenever they see your face, they, oh, he looks familiar. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, um, just now, I told the children that uh, Alex was here last year, and they said, "Wow, he was here last year." He said, "Yes, he did. He was here." Um, yeah. So I hope to see uh, to meet people and uh, um, to show. Um, um, yeah. One more thing I, I want to share is that about the the children working in a farm, I want to tell people that the children, they uh, uh, they can contribute a lot into the, uh, the change. And uh, um, I want to see the people respect the children more. Uh, they don't see them as just a child, uh, just but see them as a partner, as a, and um, equality. Um, it, uh, with, with respect and with love and care um, and um, to see that how they are important as well. We, uh, we want to see, what to say, he, we want to um, do good things, right? But so we have to need a good children, uh, uh, a, a nurture children. If we don't have nurture children, how can we have uh, a nurture a human, a, a, an adult, a good adult. So that's why we need to start from a baby, from a, a child at a very young age. Um, and I hope to see more people care for children 
and um, you can support us, but you can also care of the children around you, the neighbor children. They want to to see your smile. They want to uh, uh, to be eye contact with you, to to have your touch, care, and hug. Uh, not only new children, of course, but any children that you see on the street, or just to your neighbor or your or your nephew and um, nieces as well. Uh, yeah, so. It, they are beautiful and uh, they <laughs> they need uh, need us thank you that's it <laughs> okay thank you so much sister hang and unfortunately it's time to wrap up uh, i feel very full and very nourished and i feel seeds have been planted to continue this series um so the idea is um please send any ideas or questions that you have you can send them to to me uh, I'll put my email address there, or you just send them to info at wakeup.org. Um, or if you would, if you want to be a panel member on a future sharing, or you have more unanswered, unanswered questions that we can delve into in a further session. Um, my my idea is to continue the topic of food, and maybe next time talk about uh, plant-based food and, and veganism, how we see that, to invite some friends who are very much into that, to see how that connects to their practice. Uh, maybe also do a session on forests and trees, agroforestry and reforestation. I know some uh, Sangha members are into these things. Um, and if you know some some who are, please uh, send me their detail, details so I can, I can contact them and we can have another beautiful sharing in about a month or so. Um, yeah, and then I would just uh, like to thank all the panel members, Brother Mick, uh, Brother Will, Brother Tenzin, uh, Sister Hang, Sister Julie, Sister Andrea, and thank all of you uh, for coming. Uh, we will upload the video soon on our Facebook and on our YouTube. Um, I don't know if uh, any of the panel members uh, wants to say uh, a final word or final goodbye, please uh, go ahead. Um, and then we'll end with uh, three sounds of the bell. I quickly just share, uh, we're all connected through the, the thread of Plum Village, but we're all over the world. And we're from different cultures and different nationalities. And it's important for me to, to sort of share in some way to like empower, especially the beautiful words from, from Vietnam, from the children. That's, it's not just about what happens in Plum Village, it's about what happens in our own communities and with our own circles of friends. The monastics do an amazing job to, to hold space for people when they're here and, and travel around the world, but they don't have, they're not farmers. They don't have the capacity to be farmers or to grow food. So it's, it's amazing to see, I counted over 50 different panels, little squares this morning with everybody representing something that's happening in their community, wherever they are in the world. Um, so it's, it's important just to, yeah, not to, to be so devotional to the, if we conceive of Plum Village in France as a, a modern day root temple of this tradition, that we can all be completely empowered to, to, to benefit Mother Earth in, in our own communities where we are. So I'm, I know everybody is engaged in some way or there's a seed of aspiration to do that. So I'd just like to share that. And thank you all for what you're doing. Okay, so Let's enjoy three sounds of the bell and then let's deeply enjoy our food also today. Uh, I wish you all, uh, after this spiritual nourishment, lots of physical nourishment, uh, very healthy uh, yeah, food and, and, and happy food. <laughs> uh, so thank you all for coming and uh, let's take a deep breath and then uh, uh, part ways.
Thank you. Gaman.